Good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Natasha. You might know me as Natasha the Robot. Um, I'm also a, like as my alter ego. <laughs> Uh, I'm a digital nomad, so I don't have a home and I just travel around the world and I just work for myself. Um, and I do a lot of Swift. I love Swift, so I've been doing Swift since it came out. And I run uh, the newsletter, as was mentioned, for This Week in Swift that comes out every Monday. Uh, I run a Swift job board and uh, I combine my love of travel and meeting new people. Uh, as at creating my own conference, uh, Try Swift. So we had one in Japan uh, early in the year and then in New York and uh, might have those again. So uh, it's really great uh, because I don't have a home. The iOS community is sort of my home. So everywhere I go, I try to meet the local developers and get like food recommendations I got from people yesterday. So that's kind of my, uh, a little bit about myself. So I'm happy to talk to anyone here. I love making new friends. Uh, but today I'm not actually going to talk about Swift. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, the app ecosystem. Uh, so there are over 2 million apps in the App Store, uh, and that's because of all of you. So give yourself a little bit of applause. <laughs> so we have like all these apps, uh, but unfortunately the App Store is not that great. So. Um, on the downside, you know, as we keep releasing these apps, uh, most smartphone users download like zero apps per month. So it's, it's very sad uh, <laughs> for us. Uh, and then even if you do get a user to download your app, you know, within a month, uh, 95, they're probably going to stop using it. So 95% of users who download your app will likely stop using it within a month. So these are horrible statistics. Um, <laughs> and probably makes you sad, and if you, you know, and that's bad for our jobs, I guess. Um, but you know, I'm not here to be a grump or anything. Uh, and then, so this is what this talk is about. It's about thinking differently about the app ecosystem and what apps are and what they will be in the future and how to get your app, um, you know, ready into the big, bigger uh, atmosphere and how. Uh, Apple is helping us. Um, so, you know, um, before it used to be that you have the app and the user downloads your app, they go to the app store, download your app, they open your app to use it. Uh, but instead, think of apps as like a set of wide features that extend beyond your app, um, and that'll help with the getting new users, getting retention, and uh, all those things that I will keep talking about. Um, and the way to, you know, how do you get more users and more retention? Uh, the key is to think um, of ways to have your user use your app without ever having to open it. So pretty much I think the only category is of apps is games. Maybe you have to open the app to play a game. But for most other apps, uh, as Apple has been adding new amazing features to, the, to iOS, um, you actually don't need to open the app, and that's a great way to reach your users. Uh, and here's a few ways that Apple uh, has helped us do that. Uh, the first one is notifications. Uh, so notifications, they were there before, but I think with the Apple Watch, they kind of came to the center. So uh, Apple Watch, it's like a cool fitness device, but then that's other use case, it's, just, it's like a notification device. Uh, so I could be walking around the world and I don't have to keep you know, pulling out my iPhone and thinking, okay, did I get this important email? You know, did I close my deal? Now the notification comes straight to my watch. I know for sure it'll get there. Uh, yeah. yeah, like a short person, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you can also reply even to notifications on your watch. And in iOS 10, Apple has also, I think because of the watch and the success of notifications, they've moved notifications um, and extended them on the iPhone. So here is an example of iOS 10 notification extensions. And you know, without ever opening the app, in this case iMessage, uh, I can have a whole conversation with the person. So that's something that you should be aiming for as well with your app. What if the user doesn't have to open it? 
you know, what if they get a notification and they can completely use your app without ever opening it? Uh, one app that does a really good job is Foursquare. Uh, they actually know that, hey, I'm in a, this, I was in Italy for the past two months, so you know, it knew that I came to a new uh, city and without me ever having to open the app, it told me the top three attractions. And even here in Singapore, Foursquare knows that, hey, it's dinner time, here's top three restaurants that you should go to. So without ever opening Foursquare, it's really useful to me as a user. And I actually went and did everything it told me. <laughs> uh, so this is like really, really powerful stuff. Um, and you should be thinking how you can add those you know, to your app. The next big thing, um, big feature that is new and really powerful and lets you not open the app is speech recognition. Um, I will be the first to complain about the removal of the headphone jack. <laughs> I'm happy to argue about it. Uh, but uh, this article about AirPods like really opened my eyes. And the point of the article is while Apple is currently you know, saying these are kind of Bluetooth headphones, uh, in reality this is, you can think of AirPods as a replacement for, like as a Google Glass competitor, right? The Apple's Google Glass. Google Glass was this ugly thing that's in your face. <laughs> you know, it's like embarrassing to wear. But AirPods are very subtle, right? They're like in your ear. If, you have, if you're a girl, you have hair, like it covers. Like nobody has to know that you have AirPods on. The battery lasts all day. That's the biggest issue with uh, Bluetooth headphones currently. Like the battery is horrible, but they made sure that their battery lasts all day because they want you to have these in your ears. You know, basically the next step is gonna be embedding a chip in your brain. But <laughs> the goal is to have your Siri like in your ears full time while walking around the world and it's gonna be telling you, whispering things in your ear. Uh, so, um, this is like, these are really big, right? But um, the problem is, you know, speech recognition technology is not quite there yet. Like maybe it's at 95%. This is according to Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report. Uh, so it's not, they can't go like all the way with it just yet because the technology is not there. Like I have an accent, so it, you know, Siri doesn't recognize me speaking really well. But uh, I thought this was really interesting while it's horrible right now. Um, this quote from you know, this uh, chief scientist at Beidou, uh, he says that the difference between 95% accuracy and 99% accuracy is, like, is gonna be like, really game changing. So you know, currently we're kind of in this annoying phase where we got rid of uh, headphone jacks, we're gonna transition to the AirPods, it's kind of a slow transition. And then while the technology catches up, where speech recognition is 99%, those, you know, the AirPods are the, your new computer in your ear. So, um, what does this mean? <laughs> that means, like, again, when you think of your app, it's not, it's not something where the user is going to go and open the app. The user is going to uh, tell stuff to Siri, and the Siri will open your app, and will read from your app and tell the user. Currently, Siri, uh, the Siri API is very limited. Um, it only has, you know, like six things. You can book a ride with it, you can pay, f pay with it, you can send a message. Uh, so it's very limited and people have complained that it is limited, but I think that goes back to that speech recognition limitation where we want, I think Apple wants the user experience for Siri and like going into your app to be as smooth as possible. Because once you kind of get used to it and they can, and it improves, the technology improves and um, adding the user will actually trust Siri and will use the AirPods. Um, so I think that's kind of why it's limited. But if you do have an app that can take advantage of these APIs, you know, build that as a feature, and now you get users for free, right? They never have to open your app. You added this feature, and now the user talks to Siri. They go into your app without ever opening it. They get the information they need. Uh, the next big thing are extensions. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, user retention is just horrible. So nine, you know, 95%, actually people don't, even if they download the app, they might never open your app or they might open it once and then never come back. 
Well, extensions are a great way to integrate into existing apps uh, that are highly used. Uh, so one example is Apple Maps. So like I have the Apple Watch, so I use Apple Maps because it tells me like where to go. Uh, and you know now when I search for a restaurant, it can uh, Open Table can integrate with it, and I can immediately book right there from my Maps app a table. Or if I have you know Uber integrates, I can now order a ride to that location. So this is really powerful because, again, it's a feature where your user never has to open the app, uh, but they get the use of your app. Your app still gets used. Um, iMessage extensions are really big, so you can have a full, whole gelato building contest with your friend. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is very powerful because now, like, the user never goes into the app. In fact, with iMessage apps, the second user never has to even download the, your app. So they get access to your app without, like, even having to download it, which, which is huge, right, for distribution of our app. And again, the whole time, they never have to actually go into your app. They're just using a feature, and that's like an iMessage feature. Uh, this is a great example from the weather app uh, that I was impressed by, uh, I can, you know, I never, if I'm trying to like plan a picnic with my friend, uh, I don't have to go open the weather app, look at the weather, come back, type, maybe take a screenshot type stuff. I can go exactly to the iMessage app and just send a beautiful, you know, uh, like a picture of what the weather is. My friend doesn't even have to have this app to see it. So right there, without, you know, without even the other person downloading the app, they're using your app. So definitely consider you know, adding iMessage. And next thing is stickers. Those are Yelp stickers. Um, Yelp also has like an iMessage app, but uh, this is amazing for branding. So even if you can't think of a useful app uh, for your you know, iMessage app for your uh, app, uh, you can still have amazing branding just with iMessage stickers. Uh, so, you know, these are super cute. <laughs> and then that keeps the branding up. Uh, and before you laugh at iMessage stickers, um, consider this amazing quote from Adrian Horowitz, and we have some uh, Inami san from Line here. Uh, but Line Messenger is a very popular messaging app in Japan. And it says, you know, it took Line Messenger almost four months to find its first two million users, which is not bad. Like, I'd like, I'd like two million users in, 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 two, in four months. Uh, but the amazing thing is, after they added stickers, it only took two days to find the next million. And then not only that, uh, they make over $270 million just from selling stickers. So stickers are just really huge. We have a use case, you know, in Asia for these are for sure going to be popular. So definitely consider, you know, designers can make stickers. It takes two minutes. You basically load some pictures. So it's really easy to make stickers. Designers can do it without any coding experience. Um, you can sell those. And if those get popular, you know, that's a really big opportunity right there for your app to extend beyond you know, your physical app. And I think when you do send the sticker, it tells you which app it's from. Your friend now might download those stickers. It's like a super viral thing because the other person doesn't have to have the same app to, to play. So what's the future? Um, you know, we talked about all these little external, external ways where people can come to your app and use your app, but not actually ever go into your app. Uh, well, I don't know how many of you watched the Google Keynote, uh, but they added this feature called Instant Apps. And the idea is that, you know, if I go to a website, such as maybe paying for parking, uh, and it will download exactly the feature flow needed for that uh, user flow. So, for example, I go to a website to pay my ticket, uh, it will download just the screens needed to pay my ticket. So basically the user gets both the native experience and the web experience at once. <coughs> Sorry. 
Yeah. Um, so I think that's the future also for Apple, one sec. <coughs> Um, but yeah, that's the future to think about, like what if the user never even has to download your app, right? We see it already starting in iMessage stickers, but imagine they go to a website and suddenly your app or partial app gets download downloaded for that experience. So now this opens up a whole wide range of opportunities for you that doesn't have to ever go like in, into the old flow where the user downloads your app and then goes into your app to use it. So that's definitely something to think, think about. <coughs> um, so this goes, you know, I think we were freaked out maybe by the numbers today, but hopefully that challenges you to explore, to think differently and think about the new opportunities that you can have for your app distribution and that Apple is making available for us. Uh, so how can you architect your app, you know, for these type of features? Uh, what are the things you can do so that when next year WWC, Apple announces kind of like a, whatever their version of instant apps, you could be ready. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three things. There could be a lot more. So once you think about this concept, you'll probably come up with a lot more things. And the main things are frameworks, you know, vectorizing images and using NS user activity. Uh, so frameworks, um, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of extensions and I mentioned maps extension and notification extensions. Um, there's Siri extensions, but in truth, Apple has been you know, kind of quietly adding these extensions since I think iOS 7 when they did a share extension. So at this point, there's all these extensions, um, and you probably want to be using a lot of these. Um, and there's so many, like you have to scroll through this. I couldn't even take a screenshot with like all of them at once. Uh, so, you know, this is a hint. <laughs> there's a lot of extensions that's becoming more popular, uh, but there's a lot of them. So, if you do a lot of extensions, or even two extensions, or even one extension, you're duplicating code. Uh, likely, you know, you're setting up, you have your data layer, and then your extension probably shows some data. Uh, so frameworks are a great way to deduplicate your data, and, and basically the goal is to put your model layer into a framework that you can add to every single extension that you're doing. So now your data is kind of like a product, uh, you know, for now you can move fast. You can create, you know, watch OS, TV OS, notification extension. You can just go really quick with this. To create a framework, you're just creating a Cocoa Touch framework. Uh, the little key here is, um, like, you have to say allow app extensions API only. So that means that extensions might not have the same access to like certain system frameworks that your iOS do app does. So this will basically look for that and make, make sure you're not importing anything weird into your extensions. Uh, if you're using Swift, which I hope you are, <laughs> uh, but one thing to think about is uh, all the access levels. Probably if you have your model layer already, uh, you're using file private or private levels in your files, but when you move it into a framework, you now have to make that public, you know, for all the notifications and your iOS app to, to reach. Uh, so the difference between open versus public is that with open, you can subclass and overwrite methods, and public is final, right? So I would recommend, uh, since this is your model layer, that you're using across different <laughs> extensions, um, to use public, you know, unless you have a very good reason, unless maybe you have a view that you're customizing. But if for your model layer, you know, use public because you don't want some uh, notification framework to import the same data, but then override it and have something different show up, right? But you can extend it always to modify the data if you need to. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Next thing is you might, you know, when you make the framework for the model files, 
you're just making um, the framework for the layer, like kind of the, your object graph. But what if you need some documents or core data? Well, in that case, you have to use app groups, and this will allow you to share data between the different, uh, the different frameworks and extensions. And once you create an app group, you'll get a special identifier, and you just access files with the, using that identifier. So it's pretty simple once, once you get it to work. It's actually pretty, it's usually like a lot of work to set up. It's little things that don't work, but theoretically this is very simple. <laughs> uh, user defaults, so again, if you have some kind of sign-in, login information, uh, you, have, you might want to share it across your app extension because it would be weird to have the user you know, not signed in and have them sign in to see a notification or something. Uh, so you can also share user defaults, but you have to use your app group identifier. Alternatively, you can use uh, the iCloud key, key value store, and then you can use that same login data across different devices. So this is a way better alternative to use, um, actually, than just the user defaults. But there's a problem. Uh, <laughs> I talked about extensions, and I showed you extensions for iOS. But if you want to use, uh, if you want to make something for watchOS or tvOS, well, that's different platforms. So you can't use your iOS framework in watchOS or tvOS. So that's really painful. Uh, this is an article to read about it, uh, how to create cross-platform frameworks. Uh, but basically, the solution is to create kind of that cross-platform empty project, and then you move all your files into like a sources folder, which works with SPM as well. And then you kind of configure settings to point each framework to that sources file. Um, so now you kind of have a framework for iOS, watchOS, tvOS, but they're all pointing to the same model layer, so the same exact files. Uh, but, and undocumented, but maybe a better way to do it <laughs> uh, is by Max Howell. So you can actually really play around with all the settings that I'm not um, going to talk about too much, but you can read the article and see if you understand it. But uh, you can kind of hack around uh, with like special little settings, and there's a one and two for watchOS. So this is completely, I wouldn't put this in the public like open source <laughs> library, uh, but this is kind of a hacky way to create only one framework that works across watchOS, tvOS, and iOS. That's something to think about. Um, so Again, like think frameworks for your model layer. The sooner you do it, the faster you can move as you keep adding your extensions. Because all you need is add the framework. Now you have the whole data, all the model layer. And now you're, it's just a matter of making the UI for each extension. Um, extensions let you, or frameworks let you keep your code clean, not duplicate. Um, and then you can use app group and I, iCloud key value storage to share the data. Um, and possibly create cross-platform uh, frameworks as well. So next is uh, images. So across different devices, your images will be different sizes. Uh, so this is where I recommend like really going to your designer from now on and just demanding vector images. And they can give you the vector images as a PDF file, um, so, and that's, pretty new in the last few versions of Xcode, I think Xcode 7, that they added this. Uh, but let's say I have an ice cream, I get the vector file as a PDF that I begged my designer to do. But it's actually better for the designer because they don't have to export three different images. They just do one image, right? So it's actually an easy sell for the designer. Um, and uh, when you go drag this image in, you will see the default, you know, you get 1x, 2x, 3x. So this is just normal when you add an image to Xcode. Um, so you have to select in here, uh, there's a scale option on your image, and you can select single scale. And once you select that, it'll only give you one image place. So now you have a vector image that you can size for all devices, 
And then when your designer comes and says, this needs to be smaller, this needs to be bigger, it's just a matter of changing it in code and it will perfectly scale. So definitely use you know, vector images. Um, and another like trick, since we're talking about images, um, you might want maybe different colors because the TV is dark and maybe the iPhone is light. Well, if you have icons, you can also select an option to have an icon template image. Um, and that gets rid of any color information that you have in your vector file. Uh, so now you can just set the image's tint color and it'll make, in this case, purple, and then uh, it'll make my image purple. But maybe on tvOS you want it to be blue. So again, this is just really quick ways to work um, and to get your design process in line and ready to be on different extensions and platforms um, compared to what we're used to where we just have one app that's just contained. Um, yeah, so to summarize, like, make sh like just go and get PDFs. Like, you shouldn't get <laughs> PNGs anymore. Um, and if it's icons, you can just easily, you know, it's a no-brainer to have color information change, because when new things come out, your designer wants a new color, different platforms, easy, just like one line of code. You can also do this in IB, uh, if you do like a keypad thing, so it's, it's really easy. And finally, this is the most important one, is NS user activity. Um, so I mentioned before <laughs> kind of how Apple ha or Google has now instant apps where you go from the website, you go straight into downloading a part of the app you know, that you never had. Well, user activity already allows a little bit of that. Um, if you've done universal links, um, those are really powerful. So universal links are when a user goes to your website and instead of opening the website, it opens your app. And this is if they have it installed. But imagine if maybe in the future, maybe they don't have it installed yet, but this is, I think, where like the, techn you know, this is where it would hook in to be like, it's not installed yet, but what should I do if I were to download some part of your app, right? Uh, but for now, if the user has you know, Instagram installed and I go to Instagram.com, I should be redirected to my app. Uh, so user activity is like, uh, universal links are like super easy to use. The really hard part is the web stuff. So the key is, uh, it's very secure, so the key is that on, the, on your server, on your website, you have to upload like a special JSON file with an identifier. And the reason is so that nobody can hijack your link. So when you have you know, Twitter, you click on the Twitter uh, link, it's gonna go to Twitter. It's not gonna go to Tweetbot or some malicious service that's gonna hijack all the Twitter links and have it open in their app. Uh, so, that's kind of the hard stuff, right? The, your server team, or you, you have to upload some file, the JSON file with an identifier that matches your iOS app to the web. But once you upload that file from the website, you know, web uh, backend version, uh, it's super easy. So all you do is you have this app delegate method that says, you know, continue user activity and restoration handle. And this is what you use for all the user activity, which can get very messy, as I'll walk through <laughs> later. Uh, but you're basically saying, if the activity type is the person is browsing the web, you can uh, parse the web, you can get the web page URL from the activity, and then you can parse that URL, get the little path components from the URL. And if you have a matching item, if you have a shopping app and you have, you know, dress ID five, now you can look up in your app, and if you have a description field for dress of ID5, you'll direct the user straight to that dress. So it's really a magical um, experience because it combines the web surfing and it gets them to your app without, you know, without them explicitly opening the app but getting the information that they need. Uh, you can also use user activity uh, to do things like search when people search in Spotlight, your app will come up. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, and this is all the same API, so just a slightly different stuff. But 
uh, I was searching for the best gelato in, on Foursquare in Italy, and um, this place came up, and when I went to my map, it showed that place right away. So I didn't have to go to Foursquare, copy the place, I just went straight to Maps, clicked on it, and then it gave me the navigation. So this is like really amazing integrations that you can do for your user. Um, it can do contextual remind reminders, so this is really easy to implement as well. Like you can say, Siri, can you remind me about this? And whatever page their user is on, it'll create a reminder if you implement this API. Um, so this is really powerful. This is when you're thinking of speech recognition stuff, right? Um, so now like they've gone outside of your app, they created a reminder, Siri integrated with it. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, you can also even send messages. So you can integrate with uh, the contacts API. And now like you can see WhatsApp uh, and this is like a WhatsApp audio. So if you have anything like that, you can easily integrate and have your, as soon as the person goes to the contact app, they can go straight to your app or they can receive calls. They can interact right in the contact app. Uh, so I'm gonna show really quickly. Um, this is, again, very similar to other APIs, but the idea is that you know, I looked up a gelato flavor and now I searched for this gelato flavor and it shows me the detailed page for it. And again, this is like super powerful because the user never went, opened your app, searched for the stuff, but it came up in suggestions naturally. So this is a built-in system that people use, uh, has a lot of retention and a lot of users and it goes straight into your app. Um, so this is all it is. I click Strachatala, it shows me the right detail page. Um, so this is all you have to do, and this, it's very similar for every other thing that I showed you. Uh, but basically you're just creating an activity, an user activity, you have a special identifier for it. And this is just like a quick overview and the slides will be online so you don't have to remember it. Uh, but you have the activity title, uh, where the name of the what you want to show in the app results when the user actually starts searching. Um, you have keywords they can search to get to your page. Um, and then you can even do stuff like, hey, it can hand off to iPad. Uh, it, can, it could be search, it could be public index. So if you have some kind of banking information, you don't want that public indexed. Uh, but if you have some kind of you know, ice cream place, yeah, of course, have it indexed, it's free. Um, and then you have user activity, you have to assign it to a user activity. So a user activity is this weird uh, global variable on the UI responder class. Uh, so it's really weird, but you have to assign your activity to it because if the user goes back to the previous screen, your activity will be deallocated. Um, so you kind of have to assign it to this global variable so it sticks around. Um, and then, of course, you have to say become current. Uh, so that's just one of those bugs where you're like, why is this not working? And you're going to spend forever on, but you just forgot to activate it. Uh, finally, you can add some, uh, you can say like before it saves, you can extend the NS user activity delegate and you can give it extra information. So for gelato, right, uh, you want to, or for shopping or whatever, your cars, you want to give some kind of index that you can look up in your database. Um, so this is a great way to add that and you can add that additional, any additional information or metadata that you need right there. And now to activate it, again, we're using that same uh, delegate method that we did for universal links. Uh, you have continue user activity, we get the view controller, um, and then we restore the user activity. Uh, so we kind of delegate that to the uh, view controller. And the view controller is very simple. It's just gonna look up the index, right? We have that metadata, so it's gonna look up its gelato number five, and then it's gonna give that information. Um, well, you have to do perform segue, so it's kind of awkward because you have to have a variable there to to save the index, because you have that, get, that gets called in prepare for segue. So once you have prepared the segue, um, you can say like, you know, if the row was selected, do that. If there's a search gelato index identifier, 
then you can give that to your new detail view controller and then your view controller can show the details. Uh, for more information on user activity, I highly recommend this uh, session uh, from WWC, Increased Usage of Your App with Proactive Suggestions. But, you know, I can't, like, I think if you do one thing this year to prepare for next year, <laughs> add user activities. Um, you know, basically, very easy, you know, like a few lines of code. It's not great because you have this delegate method and you're going to have to route. If this is activity from the web, go here. If this is an activity that's uh, search, go here. If it's location, go here. So you kind of have to have this annoying router, I think, object for the user activity. But once you have that implemented, whatever is the new extension or possibly, you know, possibly something like instant app that uh, Apple will implement next year, you'll be ready, right, by creating this little feature that's so powerful. So definitely do universal links. That's super easy. It requires no work. You, know, you don't have to have this stupid, like, open an app. Like, it will automatically open everything in app for the user. They have your app's discoverability, their retention. Do you naturally increase, you know, this is free users for your app. Um, so today I talked about this concept of apps, not as the old way where people download the apps, have the app on their phone, open it to use it, but thinking of it more as a web of interconnected features. So a lot of little features, you know, an extension here, an extension there, a connection to Siri. So all these little features are a way more powerful way to get users using your product um, than just the normal you know, apps that we're used to. Um, and in terms of architecture, some of the things that you can do right away that's super easy um, is just, you know, add frameworks, add vector images, and definitely use user activity, at least for universal links, but hopefully more, because only it's just adding a few more things, and now you can be in Maps, you can be in iMessage, you can be in uh, Handoff, so all these things uh, are just a few lines of code for you to add. Uh, so that's it. I talked about building features, not apps. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Okay, any questions? So uh, in my experience, uh, a lot of apps are slow to build these features, uh, don't bother at all, or even when they do, sometimes they don't give it a lot of thought to it. Have you, have you had the same experience, and have you thought at all as to like why that might be, and maybe you know, ways that that could be changed? Yeah, so I think it just, one thing is like, do your product managers know about these features? So a lot of these are new, and then I think also you already have a big pipe, you know, you already have a lot of work, and you have a lot of features, and you have a timeline, and then Apple, every WWC comes up with like, here's all these new things. But you're like, but I already had like a hundred other things to do. Um, so I think it's just a matter of maybe like educating the product person, educating yourself. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's probably, and then prioritizing them, right? I think this should be the biggest priority because that's free users. But if a product person like doesn't know about this feature, that's, it's kind of like a weird priority. And then also as iOS developers, we have to go outside of comfort zone and learn something new. And that's always kind of, I don't know, like also a mental block for me, like, oh, I can add this feature that in five minutes that I already know, or I can go extract the whole, all my model layer into a framework. Okay, <laughs> that's, a bit, that's a much bigger story and time commitment than just like adding something else, yeah. Oh, it is. Wow. Um, sorry, just to add to that, yeah, nearly every extension that we've ever done at Yelp uh, was like Apple came in and was just like, oh, here's all this stuff, and then an engineer educated a product manager, and then they prioritized it. So, yeah, a lot of it is they just don't know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Yelp has a really, they have two extensions, so definitely ask them. <laughs> ben, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, using code to create images, like paint code or something, uh, like instead of PNGs or PDFs? Like, is that going a bit too far, or? Uh, so I think you can just add those to a framework just as well as any image, right? Okay. 
it just you just use the same thing, yeah. Yeah, encode it's better, but can you skip it should have different sizes. Encode it's probably easier, right? <laughs> you have more control of it. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Hi. Uh, so a lot of these features, as you said, are not in the app. They're in the extensions or they're in search. Uh, since these features are so new to iOS itself, even though you implement this, what is a good way to get users to notice that these features even exist? Because right now in Spotlight, I search for things, but I don't know if this new app would even support this feature. So do you expect the user will just try out the new thing or is it something we should well, educate in Well, they're gonna search app? by default and then you wanna show up. <laughs> but yeah, okay. I mean, that's, it just, I think it, I think those features just naturally work because when I go to, you know, maps and Foursquare comes up, like that just, I wanna click on it because that's what I just searched. So a lot of it is meant to be super intuitive and as a user, you don't think about it. But, you know, as a developer, if you're not implementing these, then, yeah, you're not going to get the benefit. <laughs> right, okay. So yeah. these features just pop up when you're in the right apps rather than the user having to actually go and search for it on their own? Well, they just show up. When, okay. You know, when they search in Spotlight, your app will magically show up. Okay. When they search in Maps for the address, your app, Uber, will magically show up. Okay. When you ask Siri for a ride, it will magically ask you know, Lyft or Uber for whichever app you have. So for, I think from the user discoverability, there's just a lot there because it just happens for them. They don't even think about it. Uh, but from developer perspective, if you don't implement these and don't support these features, then you, you're just losing out on a huge market, like a lot of users. Okay, I will take the last question. And Natasha, yeah. and do you have an app right before you use all those user interactions, before and after? Do you have any statistics that to show now how many users, you know, new users, or maybe you know like old users? Do you have any statistics on any app? So user statistics on like doing spotlight searches or um, before an app, let's say you before you implement all the oh, okay. yeah. So like maybe you have like maybe ten thousand users, and mm -hmm. after you implement, is there any you know, like more users? Yeah, so maybe Yelp will <laughs> be able to. My apps, I don't, I don't know if that that's probably classified information, but Did, uh, yeah, okay. I would love to hear. I don't have apps that have that many users. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm guessing that's not something <laughs> you can say. Uh, but I personally, in my apps, I still have to implement it, and I don't have that many users to like compare. I don't actually have statistics, but um, that's definitely something. Like as it gets, you know, as it, people more add it and use it and add the statistics, like Yelp would be a perfect place to find those, for example. I was just to say for workflow, we found the widget to be super. Uh, super awesome. Everyone finds it and discovers it. So I think that really helps for engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you think of iMessage, I would say like probably like 90% of users use that. And then if your app is in there, then you know that you get so much you get so much exposure. Um, and maps, you know, most people, I think, unless they're using Google Maps, they're using Apple Maps. Um, so you can probably find those statistics of how many users use the other apps or notification center, right? Everyone has to use notification center. That's not a choice. Um, so maybe start looking at those numbers, but um, I think you would have to compare within your company. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll be around during coffee break and lunch if anyone wants to talk more. Okay, thank you.